What is the golden age of Hollywood for you? Big budget movies? Major film studios or maybe elegant red carpets? Names like Cary Grant and Clark Gable? Grace Kelly and Marilyn Monroe? Fair enough. But how about Eric Kongold and Max Steiner? Or Alfred Newman? These people are giants in film music of the golden age of Hollywood. We'll talk about them in a bit. But now let's travel in the past and have a look at what the classical area of Hollywood, which spans roughly from the 1930s to the end of the 1950s, actually looked like. 29th of October, 1929. Black Tuesday. This day, all Americans will remember as the stock market crash. Billions of dollars were lost, wiping out thousands of investors. 30th of January, 1933. Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. The Great Depression in the worldwide economy was still going on. Roughly a quarter of the American workforce couldn't find a job. 1st of September, 1939. The Second World War had just started in Europe. 7th of December, 1941, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Soon after that, the USA entered the war. 8th of May, 1945, German armed forces surrendered unconditionally. In four months, Japan would sign the surrender document too. Sounds awful, doesn't it? However, Hollywood felt never better than during this year's. This was the most productive time in the history of the film business in terms of the number of films produced. In the 1930s, approximately 80 million Americans, which is 65% of the population, went to the movies once a week. Today, this percentage is much lower, under 10% only. People wanted to forget about their struggles, even for two hours, and the cinema was the cheapest way to do so. In the early days of Hollywood, several big movie studios produced the majority of films. Nowadays, almost everybody knows their names because they remain the leaders of the film industry. They were also each known for having certain kinds of films. For example, Warner Brothers was known for adventure stories, Universal for horrors and comedy movies, and MGM for grand dramas. Because of the number of films needed to satisfy the audience, the studios developed a system that was like the assembly line. Each studio was a completely self-contained filmmaking factory, where every aspect of the process was owned and controlled by the individual studio, and every person involved, whether screenwriter, director, composer, editor or others, was simply one of the small details in this huge film production mechanism, and could be easily replaced if they started to slow down the process. The only person with somewhat absolute power was the production executive. The music as well was produced on an assembly line basis. All people from the music department were under one roof in a music building that contained a music library and recording studio. The head of the music department was often a composer or conductor, like Alfred Newman, who had at the music department at 20th Century Fox for many years during the 40s and 50s. The musical language of that time was adapted to the movie genre. This is one of the reasons that so many cliches sprang up in Hollywood films and music of the 1930s. Basically, producers work under one rule. If it works, do it again. So, naturally, there is a conservative desire to use that was tried and proven both in filmmaking and in music. Another reason is that there is hardly time to work out fresh, original, creative ideas. The deadlines and the pace of the process in that period were very rapid, even by today's standards. So everybody in the department would know what to do, when and how. I want you to cook. Cooperate. I After want the you composers to began writing, their sketches would go down to orchestrators, right. copists, proofreaders, anyway. and finally, well to the orchestra. All these roles and jobs still exist today, but it's not done under one roof, and it's not controlled by the studio to the same degree of detail. Of 
For many scholars, Max Steiner's music for King Kong, released in March 1933, marks the emergence of the classical Hollywood score. It was one of the first movies in which music was not just a background asset, but a special element, an indicator of different worlds. King Kong's linkage between non-diegetic music and fantasy elements in the film's narrative remains the most commented upon Scott's technique. The movie's opening scenes, which depict harsh, pragmatic reality in an urban setting, feature no music of any kind. King Kong continues to avoid music until the characters approach the mysterious Skull Island. Interestingly, music continues through many of the final scenes set back in New York City, where the marvellous world of Skull Island and the familiar, modern environment blow together. King Kong's use of themes, especially a three-note descending motif that denotes Kong, constitutes a key precursor to classical film music practice, as well as Mickey Mousing and using sound effects. Overall, Max Steiner's music for King Kong helps audiences to accept the fantasy world of Skull Island and sets the benchmark for the classical Hollywood film score. The key element in the film music of that time was its romantic idiom. Many of the composers in Hollywood had been born in Europe at the end of the Romantic period and were trained and influenced by Romantic era composers like Wagner, Puccini, Strauss and Verdi. Also, from its inception, film music was deemed to be a close cousin of opera, so there is no wonder that, according to Steiner, Wagner would have been the number one film composer if he had lived in this century. Two main ideas of Romanticism composers adapting to film music were using a melody as an accessible music structure for untrained listeners and using a late motif for helping in navigation through a film narrative. But of course, Hollywood film composers trying to find a unique musical language. Steiner had got from his 1933 triumph with King Kong, which combined romantic themes with dark primitive rhythms, to the multi-thematic, and flavoured masterpiece, Gone with the Wind just six years later. Alfred Newman had progressed from the Gashvenik Street scene, 1931, to the romantic Wuthering Heights in 1939. Eric Congo, perhaps the most respected composer in Hollywood by his background as a composer of serious concert music, had won Oscars for his symphonic scores for Anthony Atlas and The Adventures of Robin Hood two years later. His score for Robin Hood, which highlights almost every scene, employs a leitmotif method, wherein a musical motif identifies a person, place or thing. Especially memorable is Robin's theme, which is prominently featured during the opening titles. However, when Anthony Atlas won the Academy Award for Best Musical Score in 1937, the award was presented to music department chief Leo Formstein. Korngold, as the score's composer, did not even write a mention. It's a good thing that this practice went changed later, but during that time, the film production system would stay at both individuals. And yet, film music, as well as film composers, weren't considered serious by most music critics. Film music was rarely noticed by the average filmgoer, and also it was considered a poor commercial risk by the record companies. Despite its 19th century classical roots and frequently memorable melodic themes, it was deemed neither classical nor popular. No one seriously believed movie music would sell. The first exception to the rule came in January 1938, when Victor Records released songs from Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, an album of three discs with eight songs. This was the first American original soundtrack album from a feature film. All three discs charted, with Someday My Prince Will Come reaching Billboard's top 10. The golden age of Hollywood ended for a myriad of reasons. Chief among them were the growing popularity of television, the rising costs from film production, and the Big Five antitrust legislation. 
In 1948, the Supreme Court ruled against the major film studios by determining that Hollywood had become oligarchical. Every one of the big five studios were vertically integrated. In other words, they controlled every facet of film, from pre-production to distribution. This allowed them to monopolize the cinema industry, and some argued that it went against the idea of a free market. After that, Hollywood was never the same. Independent theaters began to show movies made by studios other than the big five, including foreign films. By the 1960s, the golden age of Hollywood officially ended. Many of the stars of the era were retired, and others were simply dead. At this time, young filmmakers like Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Francis Ford Coppola, and Woody Allen emerged to take Hollywood in a new direction.